И снова привет! Мы продолжаем наш виртуальный праздник знаний и опыта, и настало время затронуть чуть более узкую, но от того не менее важную тему интеграции. Если бы мы были офлайн, я бы попросил поднять руку тех из вас, кто в своих проектах так или иначе использует поисковый движок Elasticsearch. Ну, а раз мы онлайн, собрались здесь виртуально, то, наверное, следовало бы мне запустить какую-нибудь форму с опросом, потом проиндексировать ее, например, тем же Elastic, открыть кибану и набросать запросик для получения результатов. А может быть, было бы чуть более наглядно а, напилить небольшое демо-приложение на Spring Boot и вывести результаты из Elastic через него. Почему бы и нет? Хотя тянуть сюда Spring, значит, стрельба из пушки по воробьям. Зато там есть стартеры для, для интеграции с Elastic. Чем не прелесть? Ну да, хватит гадать, какие там есть варианты. Ведь у нас буквально за кулисой ждет спикер, который уже готов провести нас по всем дебрям вариантов интеграции с Elastic Search. Поскольку это будет англоговорящий спикер, то дальше, если вы не возражаете, I will speak from my heart. So let me introduce our next speaker, a passionate Java enthusiast, seasoned IT consultant, well-known speaker and one of the most active members of Bulgarian Java user group. Please welcome Martin Toshev. Uh, in this session, I'll uh, speak about the various integrations that, that are out there for Elasticsearch uh, and will show some interesting demos in that regard. Uh, first, a few short words about me. So, uh, my name is uh, Martin Toshev. I'm one of the uh, guys that helps run the events of the Bulgarian Java User Group. And we um, organize a regular Java conference every year called J Prime. Yeah, unfortunately, as you know, due to the COVID situation, we, we've uh, postponed the conference for better times. I'm currently a software architect uh, at a product company called Resolve Systems, where we develop uh, an automation engine entirely based on uh, Java Standard Edition. And we provide a number of integrations, uh, of integrations with Elasticsearch and the Elastic Stack. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of them in this session. In particular, uh, I'm going to touch a bit on uh, some of the internals of the Elastic Stack. We're going to make a very gentle and short introduction on the Elastic Stack, just as a recap for everybody uh, of you. Uh, I guess uh, most of you are aware or at least have heard of what is Elasticsearch and what it does. Uh, and then we'll uh, see what are the different types of integrations that allow us to connect with the Elasticsearch uh, uh, service or cluster through our Java applications. I'll also demonstrate how we can use interesting Elasticsearch plugins, uh, for example, for uh, text analytics uh, in our documents that we index. And last but not least, I'll demonstrate how we can build an Elasticsearch plugin of our own in case we need a functionality that's not out there in Elasticsearch, but we need it and we need to put, we need to put it in uh, Elasticsearch itself. So let's get started. So the Elastic Stack is centered around four uh, major components, as you're probably aware of already. That's Elastic. Uh, you can think of Elasticsearch as a full text search engine or as a NoSQL database. Uh, there are different ways we can describe Elasticsearch, but the easiest to understand how Elasticsearch is implemented is uh, a web server on top of the Lucene uh, library. So Elasticsearch is at the center of the Elk Stack. We have Kibana as the de facto standard user interface for interacting with Elasticsearch. We have Logstash for integrating different kinds of third-party systems with Elasticsearch, whereby Logstash provides us the possibility to put data in Elasticsearch from a variety of data sources, such as the system, various message brokers, and so on and so forth. And we have uh, a number of so-called BITS applications that are, in fact, lightweight agents that allow us to connect collect data from different sources, such as the operating system, uh, from log files, uh, from network logs, and so on and so forth. Bits are really lightweight applications. Uh, light, bits are lightweight, uh, lightweight applications that really uh, allow us to uh, interact with the Elastic Stack. Um, Elasticsearch is at the moment one of the leading 
uh, full text search engines on the market. Uh, there are different competitors based on the different segments whereby we can use Elasticsearch in, such as Zolar, for example, is another really good alternative to Elasticsearch. Uh, or Splunk if you want to uh, aggregate a number of logs. Uh, however, I really recommend Elasticsearch for a number of purposes, last but not least, during the fact that it provides a lot of integrations with a lot of systems. So this is how the Elk stack looks like in terms of interaction between the different components. We have the Beats applications that allow us to aggregate and collect data, and Beats applications can put data directly in Elasticsearch or through Logstash pipelines. Uh, we also have Kibana that allows us to not only query Elasticsearch, but also provides us with the possibility to create uh, really nice diagrams and visualizations for Elasticsearch data. So Elasticsearch, as I mentioned, you can think of it as a web server built on top of the Lucene Java library, uh, or you can think of it as a document-oriented database. And uh, it, in fact, provides way more functionality that's not provided by Lucene itself, such as, for example, the possibility to cache uh, search results, the possibility to bring up uh, a cluster of instances that allow us to distribute the indexing of data, uh, which is something that's not provided by the Lucene library out of the box. And it also provides a really nice JSON-based REST API uh, that allows us to do uh, the different kinds of activities uh, with Elasticsearch uh, from external applications. And in fact, that's the main way many applications interact with Elasticsearch through the JSON-based REST API. And this is the how uh, Elasticsearch interacts with Lucene uh, below the scenes. So an Elasticsearch index is uh, split uh, into one or more Elasticsearch shards. Uh, and an Elasticsearch shard corresponds to, an, uh, to a Lucene index on the particular node in the Elasticsearch cluster. A Lucene index, on the other hand, is split into one or more Lucene segments, which are in fact files stored on the file system where the documents indexed by Elasticsearch are stored. So this is the relationship between Elasticsearch and Lucene. And we might also designate some of the shards as replica shards. Uh, so in fact, we, we can replicate some of the uh, documents that are indexed in a particular shard. Internally, when we send a request to Elasticsearch for indexing of documents, it routes that particular request to a particular shard in the Elasticsearch cluster. And uh, the important thing to note here is that this document is not written right away. Uh, to the disk, to the Lucene segment that stores it, uh, but it's written in several uh, areas of memory. Uh, in particular, we have the memory buffer and the transaction lock. The memory buffer stores the document and uh, by default, every one second refreshes it uh, to the file system cache from where it's written to the disk. And we also have the transaction lock that keeps information on all the operations that happen uh, on the Elasticsearch instance. Uh, it also is an in-memory structure that commits data uh, over a particular um, uh, time fragment on the disk. Internally, Elasticsearch is comprised uh, of different modules, uh, and modules are loaded during uh, startup of Elasticsearch. Uh, at present, Elasticsearch still uses a modified version of Google GIS, although there are plans to move away uh, from Google GIS as a plugin system. But when Elasticsearch starts up, it loads all the uh, default system modules uh, that the server provides. And they provide a number of capabilities that comprise the different functionalities provided by Elasticsearch. To give you a glimpse of that, this is how, for example, we bind uh, different modules uh, using the JIS binder. Uh, we have different modules that allow us to uh, manage plugins in Elasticsearch. We have modules that allow us to manage the state of the instance of the current Elasticsearch instance. Uh, we have different nodes that manage the various thread pools that internal Elasticsearch uses for uh, handling of requests and so on and so forth. Some of the core modules in, in Elasticsearch are, for example, discovery and cluster formation. That, are used, that is used to uh, allow us to uh, manage the different nodes in the Elasticsearch cluster and to, uh, for the Elasticsearch cluster to discover new nodes. We also have HTTP module that implements the uh, JSON-based REST API for Elasticsearch. We have plugins module that allow us to manage different plugins for Elasticsearch. 
uh, and uh, also modules like thread pools for managing the internal thread pools for transport that allows us to establish the communication between the Elasticsearch nodes in a cluster and so on and so forth. This is, these are just few of the core modules that are uh, provided by the Elasticsearch uh, server. And there are a number of other modules that you can also see from uh, the Elasticsearch code base. Uh, the basic data structure used by Elasticsearch is an inverted index and indexes are stored on disk in separate files, as we already mentioned, uh, in terms of Lucene segments. And search can also be performed on multiple indexes, not only just on a single instance. Uh, there is uh, the earlier in Elasticsearch, uh, prior to version 7.0, uh, documents were logically grouped by type, which was effectively dropped off. So this was one of the very major changes that were introduced in uh, recent versions of Elasticsearch. And in order to ensure a result relevancy, Elasticsearch uses few algorithms to calculate uh, score relevance. The default algorithm is so-called term frequency inverse document frequency, which is based on two concrete factors. One is the uh, how many times the term occurs in the particular document that is being indexed. And the other factor is how many times does this term occur in other already indexed documents. And based on that uh, algorithm, Elasticsearch determines how relevant is that document compared to other documents during search requests. We, if we want, we can also use a different uh, algorithm uh, uh, process, uh, but we are not going to discuss that uh, in this session. So uh, Elasticsearch provides in a variety of scenarios uh, uh, faster retrieval documents than a traditional related relational database. That's why it's the preferred application to use for uh, indexing documents for the purpose of searches. A traditional relational database typically uses indexes implemented using uh, searches like uh, Bitree or hash table, uh, and that poses significant limitations on the types of queries that we can apply uh, in order to search for documents and to do, it, to do that in a faster manner. And that's why the, uh, the, uh, the data structure that Elasticsearch uses uh, based on inverted indexes, proves to be way more performant in a number of scenarios. And documents in Elasticsearch might not have an explicit schema, although it's uh, preferable to specify a mapping uh, for certain fields of the document that we index. Uh, and certain fields also can match a pattern that identifies their field. Uh, and this can be defined by so-called dynamic mappings. And also the same field in Elasticsearch can be indexed multiple times using uh, different mechanisms or different types. Now, this is in short about Elasticsearch to give you a perspective of how Elasticsearch works internally and what's the Elk stack comprised about. Now, let's talk a bit about how we can uh, integrate our uh, Java applications with uh, Elasticsearch. A number of means of uh, uh, Elasticsearch plugins and however, other systems also provide their own specific plugins and extensions for Elasticsearch. Such as, for example, uh, if you want to interact with Elasticsearch directly, we can use one of the Java clients provided by Elasticsearch. In earlier versions of Elasticsearch, that was a so-called transport client that is now deprecated in favor of two REST-based clients, low-level and high-level REST clients, which we are going to have a look at shortly. Uh, certain web frameworks like Drupal or WordPress they have their own plugins for interacting with uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, there is also a JDBC driver uh, that allows us to interact with uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, there are built-in recipes uh, and, uh, for, uh, for Ansible, Puppet, and Chef. For example, Elasticsearch uh, um, standard Ansible playbook that allows us to provision the Elastic stack. Uh, there is an interesting project for for example, going under uh, the Hibernate uh, team, which is called Hibernate Search, which allows us to synchronize write operations to the database with Elasticsearch. Uh, it's an ongoing project. Uh, under the Spring framework, there are uh, two uh, projects that provide us the possibility to interact with Elasticsearch. This is Spring Elasticsearch, which provides us uh, some enhanced capabilities on top of the standard Java clients for interacting with Elasticsearch and Spring Data. Elasticsearch, which is the implementation of uh, uh, Elasticsearch capabilities under the Spring Data Framework. Also, there are some integrations provided with other frameworks, such 
as for example Apache Hadoop and Spark, whereby we can read or write data from Elasticsearch uh, and uh, use that data as part of our, uh, for example, Spark uh, pipeline. Uh, and there are other integrations such as, for example, with Apache Camel. This is just to give you a glimpse of uh, how big is the Elasticsearch ecosystem in terms of different integrations, not only in terms of uh, plugins provided by Elasticsearch itself or uh, the community, but also in terms of other systems that provide some integration points with Elasticsearch. Uh, a set of false actions uh, that provide free alternative to the enterprise features of Elasticsearch that cannot be used uh, as part of the open source or free versions is provided by the open distro for Elasticsearch projects. The focus there are features related to security alerting and performance analysis that are part of the uh, licensed version of Elasticsearch, but for free. And those are just different set that uh, uh, provide those capabilities for free. Uh, going back to the standard uh, clients that Elasticsearch provides for interacting uh, through a Java application, Elasticsearch pro provides two REST-based clients for Java. This is the low-level and the high-level REST clients. The main difference is that the low-level REST clients works with raw JSON uh, when sending requests to Elasticsearch, and the high-level REST client provides a Java DSL that, uh, in fact, hides the necessity to write JSON when interacting with uh, Elasticsearch. In fact, the high-level REST client uses behind the scenes the low-level REST client. And both of those replace the, the, pre the older transport client or interaction with Elasticsearch. In terms of Spring framework, uh, Spring Elasticsearch projects provide uh, additional capabilities on top of the high-level REST client for Elasticsearch. Uh, and those capabilities allow us, for example, to pre-create uh, index mappings uh, or to provide additional configuration for the index before we interact with uh, the particular index. In fact, you can think of Spring Elasticsearch uh, uh, as an enhanced version of the high-level REST client uh, that, that is uh, getting configured in Spring Framework. Uh, this is an example of how we can uh, uh, configure a uh, REST high-level client through Spring Elasticsearch. Uh, we use a particular Elasticsearch REST client factory bin that comes from Spring Elasticsearch. And that factory bin provides us ca additional capabilities that allow us to specify mapping files for the index. So if we set mapping files, that uh, the Spring Elasticsearch frameworks make sure that uh, we have uh, mapping created for that particular index. Uh, we can also provide some additional properties and so on. After we configure the REST high-level client uh, using Spring Elasticsearch, we can inject it wherever we like in the standard way. Spring Data Elasticsearch, on the other hand, provides out-of-the-box Spring configuration for Elasticsearch clients. It also provides additional annotation-based mapping metadata whereby we can create plain old Java objects and we can uh, provide, uh, additionally annotate them with uh, the annotations provided by Spring Data Elasticsearch. And using that, we can uh, directly use the Podjo to interact with Elasticsearch instead of uh, using uh, pure JSON or the high-level REST client with its DSL. So in the way Spring Data Elasticsearch works, it's pretty much similar to what we do with uh, Spring Data, for example, for a relational database. We create our entity classes, we provide proper annotations for them, and then we can use them uh, as part of our queries. And another thing Spring Data Elasticsearch provides is a template class that's a high-level abstraction that allows us to store, query, sort, and aggregate documents. It's, in fact, uh, a client that steps upon the REST high-level client and provides us with the simpler mechanisms to perform queries against Elasticsearch. It also provides us with the possibility to uh, implement custom queries as part of uh, our uh, Spring Data Elasticsearch repositories. So we can create uh, Spring Data repositories for interacting with Elasticsearch uh, using the standard mechanism with uh, naming conventions of those methods. But we, if, we don't, if we cannot use the naming convention properly, we can just update the method accordingly uh, so we can use a custom query against Elasticsearch. 
And if we use for some chance uh, CDI, also uh, Spring Data Elasticsearch uh, provides CDI support for injecting Elasticsearch repositories. Now this is the uh, this diagram shows us how uh, the different clients interact. At the bottom we have the low level REST client provided for uh, use with Elasticsearch. On top of it we have a high level REST client which also comes uh, as part of the Elastic stack. And the Spring framework, Spring Data Elasticsearch and uh, the Spring Elasticsearch projects both use the high level REST client to interact uh, with Elasticsearch. They're not rolling out their own, their separate REST client for the purpose, but they're stepping on the high level REST client. And various integrations with Elasticsearch are provided by different frameworks such as Apache Spark for processing of big data. Uh, so to give you a perspective, support for Elasticsearch is provided by a library provided uh, as part of the Elastic Stack, which is called Elasticsearch Hadoop. Uh, the, frame, the, the, the framework uh, provides Elasticsearch in terms of different, the different kinds of data structures that Apache Spark deals with. These are RDD, Spark Streaming, uh, Spark SQL, and Spark Structure Streaming. So we can interact with Elasticsearch from Apache Spark in a variety of ways. Uh, for example, if you want to write uh, a Spark a data structure represented by a Spark RDD to Elasticsearch, uh, we can uh, for, we'll use the Java ES Spark utility class that comes from that library and call the, call the save to yes method or save JSON to yes, where we pass the Spark uh, data set and then we pass the particular index uh, along with, with the type where we want to store that particular Spark data set. In a similar manner, we can also read data from, uh, from Elasticsearch and process it in Apache Spark. Uh, we create, uh, for example, a Spark RDD by calling the ESRDD method, which comes from the Java ES Spark uh, uh, class. In a similar manner, the other frameworks in Apache Spark also uh, have uh, integration with Elasticsearch through that same library, uh, Elasticsearch Hadoop. For example, if we, if we are processing streaming data, uh, through uh, these streams uh, in, in the Apache Spark, we can use the Java Spark streaming class to save di data that is uh, coming from uh, Spark this stream to uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, and we can do pretty much the same for data sets and data frames. So data sets and data frames in Apache Spark are newer version of, of the RDD entities that uh, earlier versions of Apache Spark provided. So those enhanced types of data sets also can be written to Elasticsearch and read from Elasticsearch. We have another class provided by the library, which is Java ES Spark SQL, which allows us to store data sets or data frames uh, in Elasticsearch. Uh, and we can also uh, write dynamic data from structure streams, uh, Spark structure streams to Elasticsearch. We can call uh, the write stream on the Spark data set. Uh, as a format, we specify ES, which uh, stands for Elasticsearch. And calling the start method, we, we can start writing that streaming data uh, to, the, to the particular Elasticsearch index. So as you can see, a lot of options to write and read data uh, from Elasticsearch uh, between Elasticsearch and Apache Spark. So if some of you are considering, in fact, uh, using Apache Spark and integrating that to Elasticsearch, you, uh, there is already a pretty good integration for that. Uh, many applications, uh, for example, specific languages or requiring more specific types of analysis of the documents in Elasticsearch may use different kinds of Elasticsearch plugins. Plugins in Elasticsearch also are provided, for example, for alerting or other purposes. Uh, and uh, plugins exist in a different forms. We have standard plugins provided for the Elastic Stack. We also have community plugins and we also have some vendor extensions that are implemented in terms of Elasticsearch plugins. An example of such a plugin I would, I would like the Rosette plugin that provides text analytics capabilities to Elasticsearch. The Rosette API is uh, fairly rich. It, it's a proprietary API, but there is also a trial version that uh, one can play with and decide if the capabilities that it provides in terms of uh, NLP can be used for in uh, combination with the documents stored in Elasticsearch. And of course, if no good alternative exists for a 
for something that you want to achieve with Elasticsearch, you can also decide writing your own plugin for Elasticsearch, uh, which is uh, which pro Elasticsearch provides a Java-based API for that purpose. And it's really not complex to get started with that. Um, really, it's here is that if you want to write a plugin for Elasticsearch, you can find a similar plugin uh, over the internet as a community plugin or one of the standard plugins. And you can see how it's implemented and uh, customized for your own purposes. Um, there is at present no uh, rich documentation on the Elasticsearch plugin API. So the good way to find a, a nice plugin that's already implemented, it's free and open source, and you can see how it's implemented and customize it for your own needs or just use it as a reference for the implementation of your own plugin. Uh, so one of the plugins I'm going to show you, uh, the Rosette plugin, uh, it provides enrichment capabilities. For example, it provides a different uh, possibilities to extract information from the index text. It provides with the possibility to, re uh, to recognize the text of the document or to provide language recognition capabilities. Uh, uh, it provides things like sentiment analysis, and other processing capabilities. And uh, the Elasticsearch Rosette plugin is, provides different JEST processors. And JEST processors allow us to pre-process the data before it's indexed in Elasticsearch. Now, let's look at how uh, uh, different integrations work for uh, Elasticsearch. First, uh, I've already started uh, an instance of Elasticsearch in Kibana uh, on my local machine single instance of both, not in a cluster. And the first thing we can uh, have a look at is how we can use make use of the low-level REST client. So first thing, if we use Maven or Gradle, uh, for example, we provide a dependency to uh, the low-level uh, REST client. Uh, this REST client, uh, we can specify it as uh, Elasticsearch uh, REST client dependency. And if we want to use the high-level REST client, we need to provide another dependency, which is Elasticsearch REST high-level client. Fairly straightforward to get started with the low-level REST client. We just create an instance uh, of a REST client class. Here we specify uh, one or more Elasticsearch hosts. So one of the nice things behind the low-level REST client is that it provides uh, load balancing capabilities. If you specify here, uh, multiple nodes uh, from the Elasticsearch cluster. You, you even don't need to specify all of the nodes in an existing Elasticsearch cluster, just two or three of them, and the client just retrieves information about the rest of the, uh, of the nodes in the cluster when it connects the first time. Uh, so the low-level REST client provides a number of uh, nice things such as load, load balancing, also failover if, uh, for example, the request cannot make it to one of the instances it also provides a smarter way to determine that an instance in the cluster is down and the client does not attempt to connect to a certain period of time. And so in initializing that instance of a REST client, we specify one or more hosts from the Elasticsearch cluster. In that particular case, I specify just a single host on uh, my local host port uh, 9200, the standard port for Elasticsearch. Uh, then I create a request instance that represents my search request. And uh, that request instance, I need to specify the HTTP method and the uh, Elasticsearch endpoint. In that particular case, I'm going to search from some data in the order data index. Uh, and then in that search request, I call the set JSON entity method, whereby I need to provide uh, just pure JSON uh, that represents the body of the request. So that's one of the main drawbacks of using the low-level REST client, that you need to craft that JSON yourself. Whether you're using something like uh, some JSON marshaller, uh, like Jackson, or some other library, you need to do, it, to do that yourself if you use the low-level REST client. Uh, then you perform the request uh, using that search request, and you read uh, the response. In that particular case, we just read it as a string and print it out. But we can also parse it uh, from the JSON that gets returned as a response. Now, before I uh, run this example, I need to create, of course, uh, this order data index. So uh, uh, for that purpose, I'm going to open uh, Kibana on my local host. Mm -hmm. 
it takes a few seconds to load. So uh, when Kimbana loads, I'm just going to go to the developer console. It's the, uh, really the most preferable way to interact with Elasticsearch uh, through Kibana. Uh, and here I'm going to create, first I'm going to create mapping from my document. I'm not going to type it by hand, but I already have it pre-created. So it's a put request that creates a very straightforward um, uh, index mapping for the order data index. I'm specifying here that uh, I'm going to use uh, just one replica. And here I'm going to choose just one shard. And here under the mapping section, I specify the mapping for the different fields. So this index is going to represent some uh, data for different kinds of orders I make, for example. You can think of it, for example, as an electronic store that sells uh, hardware and it provides, uh, stores that data in this order data index. So I'm creating that index here. Now I'm going to put some data in that index. Uh, I can put a single document, of course, specifying the ID of the document. We have a different ways to put data in Elasticsearch. Here I put one order for a Dell Inspiron laptop. And I also use the bulk API of Elasticsearch to put some more data. So uh, in a bulk request, we specify the data whereby in the first line we specify some information about the document, such as the document ID. And on the next line, I specify the data for that particular document. I'm inserting, uh, in fact, nine more orders. Uh, okay, so now that we've inserted that, those orders, we can make a very simple search query. The very simple search query is a much old query that just gets us all the data from Elasticsearch, a maximum of 10 uh, records. And as we can see, we return all the 10 uh, documents that we've indexed in that order data index. Now we can do pretty much the same through Java with the uh, low level REST client. Here, as you can see, I specified the uh, much old query as pure JSON. And if I simply run that, that example, very simple example, uh, I can see that here I get as a result uh, all the uh, documents that are uh, coming from Elasticsearch. Now, uh, that's good, but uh, if we don't want to craft that JSON ourselves, we can, of course, go with the high-level REST client. At the high-level REST client, uh, it has a similar way of interaction with Elasticsearch as with the low-level REST client. We create an instance of REST high-level client. Here, we, we can use pretty much the same things with the load balancing that we can do with the low-level REST client. So here, in my particular case, I specify just a scene instance uh, of Elasticsearch, which is running on my local host. Then I create a search request for the order data index. And uh, here, using the query method, uh, I, I need to create another instance of search source builder, which is, in fact, the starting point for building the uh, DSL that's provided by the high-level REST client for querying Elasticsearch. And using that instance, I use the query method to specify the type of query that I'm going to execute. In that particular case, that's a much old query. This query builders class uh, provides uh, different kinds of queries I can execute against Elasticsearch, and I can build them using that DSL. But in that particular, particular case, that's the much old query. Uh, then I set that uh, uh, search source builder on the search request, and I call client.search passing that search request. Uh, the other nice thing is that I get uh, a search response that I can query. The results are returned in terms of a hits array that I can query, and for each one of the results, I just print it out by calling the get source a string method that, it, that returns the document as a string. Now, if I run this example, it would get me pretty much the same result as with the low-level REST client. As you can see, we get all the documents one by one here with all the data uh, that we want. So at the, the very basic, uh, way we can interact with Elasticsearch through the high-level REST client like this. It's not complex. Now, if I want to, for example, to make sure that uh, I already have that uh, order data mapping pre-created uh, before I make any search request, I can, for, and I use the Spring framework in my application, I can use the Spring Elasticsearch project. 
To use Spring Elasticsearch, I need to add another dependency in my Maven, which is Spring Elasticsearch. I, I can specify the proper version here. And when I do that, uh, I need to create a particular configuration, which is a Spring Elasticsearch configuration, uh, which extends the... Um, uh, in, this, in this Spring Elasticsearch configuration, in fact, what I need to do, I need just to create a REST high-level uh, pin for the REST high-level client, and I create that client through a factory that comes, comes from the Spring Elasticsearch project. This Elasticsearch REST high-level uh, REST client factory bin is, in fact, the starting uh, point of the Elastic, uh, Spring Elasticsearch framework. Here I specify the list of Elasticsearch nodes that are going to be used to initialize the Elasticsearch client. And I can specify additional things such as mapping, properties, and so on that are used to configure the index. Now using that client, uh, I can inject uh, an instance of the REST high-level client uh, from that bin definition uh, that uses the Spring Elasticsearch factory and use that client. So uh, here I inject the REST high-level client uh, in a component class I have. I'm initializing uh, the Spring uh, context here in the old way, directly not through Spring Boot. Uh, and uh, yeah, here uh, I make the query. So inter using that client, I just make the same query as we saw earlier with the high-level REST client. Nothing more specific here. If I run that, uh, we can see basically that we uh, get the results. We get 10 results for the 10 orders that we currently store in Elasticsearch. And if we want to uh, not interact with uh, the APIs provided by the Elasticsearch clients, but even use a higher level abstraction, we can use the Spring Data project. So for that purpose, I need to add another dependency, which is Spring Data Elasticsearch. And adding that uh, in Spring Data Elasticsearch, I, uh, I need to do several things. So first, going back to the same configuration I used for Spring Elasticsearch, I need to extend from abstract Elasticsearch configuration class that comes from Spring Elasticsearch project. Uh, and I need to override the Elasticsearch client method that tells me how I can return a REST high-level client instance. And in fact, in this uh, Spring Data setup, I'm using the Spring Elasticsearch framework to return uh, a, a REST high-level client that is going to be used by Spring Data Elasticsearch. Another thing is that uh, in order to be able to scan for entity classes or modules that are annotated accordingly for use with Elasticsearch, I need to add that annotation, enable Elasticsearch repositories, and specify the base package that's going to be scanned. In that particular case, that's the root package of my application. Now, uh, sorry, it's not the root package, but it's the Elk Workshop repository package. In that repository package, uh, what I've created is uh, one repository, a uh, Spring Data repository, which has two methods. One is the find by serial number, which is going to query all the documents in the particular Elasticsearch index that um, match by a serial number. And I also have a find by serial number using custom query method that uses a custom query uh, that allows me to uh, query Elasticsearch. This custom query uh, is written in terms of the Elasticsearch uh, JSON language that is used uh, by Elasticsearch. So I need to specify the JSON for the query here as part of this query notation that comes from Spring Data Elasticsearch. In that particular case, when I'm calling that method, this query will be executed against uh, the Elasticsearch index. It's pretty much doing the same thing as with find by serial number method, but it's using a custom query instead. And here, for the purpose, uh, my repository uh, returns as a result order data instances. These are the modules that correspond to my order data index. This is defined in the uh, repository model package. package. As you can see, this is a plain old Java object. Uh, it's been annotated with a document annotation that comes with uh, from Spring Data Elasticsearch. Here I specify the name of my index in Elasticsearch. And I also create the different uh, fields here in my Pojo that correspond to the fields of my Elasticsearch document. 
I used uh, an ID field uh, to, uh, to designate that this field is going to correspond to the Elasticsearch ID for that particular document. And I don't need to specify other annotations here for the rest of the fields. They are just uh, mapped directly. I can use, of course, other annotations to, to customize the mapping here. But in that particular case, I'm not, not doing that. They're just mapped directly. And so now that I've configured the repository and the Pojo, uh, and of course provided configuration on, uh, on the REST high-level client to be used, uh, and also uh, the packages that are going to be used by Spring Data Elasticsearch, I can use that in, a, in an example here. I can simply inject my uh, Spring Elastic Data Elasticsearch repository uh, with that outwired like this. Uh, I can also inject a Elasticsearch REST template client that I can use. I don't need to have any repositories or entities. I can use that uh, REST template class to interact directly with Elasticsearch. But uh, if we are going to use the repository, when I inject the repository, we can use it, uh, as you can guess, very simply. So I use that repository and call the find by serial number uh, method that is going to retrieve from Elasticsearch all the documents that have that serial number here. And from those documents that are retrieved, I get the description using the order data entity that's get, that gets returned uh, by the call. So running that uh, example, it uh, makes a call to Elasticsearch and returns one instance that corresponds to a single document that's retrieved that contains uh, that particular serial number, serial number. As you can see, using Spring Data Elasticsearch, one of the main benefits here is that your uh, code is very concise. You, didn't, you don't need to uh, configure any mappings in your application. Spring Data Elasticsearch can do that for you. Uh, you also don't need to uh, configure any queries here in your business logic. You can move that Spring Data Elasticsearch repositories. Uh, so if you're going with Spring Framework, this is really the recommended way to interact with Elasticsearch as the highest level of, uh, of abstraction. So these are the main clients you can use with, for interacting with uh, Elasticsearch if you use plain Java or uh, Spring Framework. Now, for example, if you want to uh, use uh, to install a third-party plugin for Elasticsearch, and use that plugin uh, as part of your uh, application stack, you can go to uh, the Elasticsearch installation directory and we can uh, use the bin Elasticsearch plugin utility. Now, in that particular case, I'm going to install the Rosette plugin uh, from Maven. One of the nice things is that I can specify a plugin using uh, Maven here, I specify the group, the artifact, and the version for that particular plugin. And it's really important to note here that you need to make sure that the plugin version that you install uh, matches uh, or works with the version of Elasticsearch that uh, you use. Uh, otherwise, you might get into uh, issues or non-working plugin. So in that particular case, I installed the Rosette plugin that corresponds to 7.5 version of uh, Elasticsearch. And that plugin, plugin is first going to be downloaded from uh, Maven Central and then installed uh, in my uh, Elasticsearch instance. Okay, uh, to make that this is installed, I can just run Elasticsearch plugin list. As you can see, I just have uh, this ROS API plugin installed. Now, uh, if I want to use that particular plugin, I need to have a uh, um, already a, a license or a trial version and I need to specify API key. Uh, in that particular case, uh, I'm just going to stop the Elasticsearch instance I have and I'm going to register an API key as requested by the plugin using that, uh, uh, that environment variable Rosette API key. So I set that variable and uh, I simply uh, restart Elasticsearch. So, uh, once Elasticsearch starts up, it will load the Rosette plugin and I can create a, an ingest processor that I can use with my current data or new data that uh, I index in my uh, order data index. In that particular case, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a, a pipeline, an ingest pipeline in Elasticsearch 
uh, that allows me to determine what's the language uh, of the documents that I index. In that particular case, what this pipeline is doing, it tells me that I, uh, I use the ROS language processor that comes from the plugin. Uh, it tries to determine the language of the description field of the documents that I try to index to Elasticsearch and puts that language as part of the uh, target field, which is language. I create that uh, ingest processor in, uh, in Elasticsearch. Uh, in that particular case, uh, I haven't specified properly the uh, Rosette API key, so I need, just need to search instance here I have. Going to set that API key here. I'm going to restart Elasticsearch. Also going to restart Kibana. If I go back to the developer console. And to try to recreate that uh, pipeline, which as you can see, it's, uh, it's fine. And now I can try to index uh, uh, a new document. I'm going to index uh, an order with a description of Zdar uh, uh, And I'm going to see if uh, the language would be recognized. As we expected, this should be Russian. So I'm going to index that document. Uh, and now if I uh, query, uh, Elasticsearch for that particular document. See, I have a language field that's marked as uh, Russian. So the language is recognized by the plugin. And this is an example of how you can use uh, such a plugin for language recognition in accordance with the documents that you index in Elasticsearch. Now, in some scenarios, for example, uh, there might not be a plugin that uh, you can use uh, as part of your application stack and you'll need to write your own. Now, if you want to write your own plugin, uh, uh, I have a very simple plugin created here. Plugins, you can create them uh, using Maven or Gradle. In particular, a plugin, uh, in a plugin, the main thing that uh, uh, marks it as an Elasticsearch plugin is uh, metadata that we specify under source main uh, plugin metadata. In plugin descriptor properties, I specify certain fields that, that I specified may Maven configuration, such as what is the Elasticsearch version for which that particular plugin applies, uh, what is the class name of the plugin, which is also injected from the POM XML file, the description, and the Java version, and other fields. And here under assemblies, uh, I also specify uh, uh, where is the uh, exactly my plugin metadata here in that uh, descriptor uh, and that I bundled my plugin as uh, in a zip format. And that's pretty much the metadata configuration for my plugin. In the POM XML file, I specify here that I'm going to build the plugin for Elasticsearch 750. Uh, and then I also need to include as a dependency uh, the Elasticsearch API so I can make use uh, that API, make use of that API in my Elasticsearch plugin. Uh, and that's pretty much it. The plugin is very simple. What it does, it filters out uh, some words that I want, don't want to have in my documents being indexed. So in order to filter certain words, uh, what I need to create is a filter word processor. Uh, here I have two things that I can specify for my processor that I define in Elasticsearch. That's the filter word and the field uh, of the document in which I want to do the filtering. Uh, here I provide the implementation of uh, the execute method that gets called when the processor is called. Uh, it's very simple. It just gets the value from that particular field and replaces the filter word uh, with an empty string and sets back the value to that uh, document field. Uh, and I also need to specify some other things in my processor, such as uh, a factory that allows me to specify what are the properties that I specify to my processor, such as the field and the filter word. 
those come from the configuration I specify in Elasticsearch when I use my plugin. And I also need to define a class that extends from the plugin class. We have uh, different kinds of plugins for Elasticsearch. Uh, in that my particular case, uh, I'm implementing the ingest plugin class, but we can have other types of plugins as well, uh, such as, for example, uh, index store plugin, or engine plugin, or discovery, or cluster plugin. These different interfaces represent the different types of plugins that we can implement. In that particular case, I have an ingest plugin. And uh, I need simply to uh, overwrite in the ingest plugin the get processors method that returns the list of processors that the plugin has. I just have one filter word processor that I can use with my plugin. Now, if I want to use that uh, filter plugin, what I need to do, I need to go and build it with Maven. I'm going to just navigate to my uh, plugin project. I can simply do uh, Maven clean install. It won't take a lot. And once the plugin builds, I can simply uh, install it uh, from the file system uh, using the same Elasticsearch plugin utility. So uh, to install that plugin, I can use the Elasticsearch uh, plugin utility. So uh, like this. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not using it. Uh, Here, so I need to use it like this and specify the path to uh, my ingest plugin accordingly. So, that particular path I want to use uh, is uh, so if I go to the directory of my uh, plugin. Under target uh, releases, I can see a zip file for my plugin. And I want to use that location here. So I'm just going to copy that location here. And I can simply say bin search plugin install. I'll, I need to use the file protocol for, for the purpose. Here, of course, I need to change these uh, slashes so I can install it accordingly. And yeah, when I change the slashes, I also need to specify uh, here the uh, name of the archive that has been built, like this. As you can see, I've installed my uh, custom plugin and now I can simply use it. So to use it, I'll create uh, uh, an, in, uh, an ingest pipeline that filters out the crap keyword from the description field. So I create uh, an ingest pipeline in Elasticsearch, which is called filter crap. And I specify that when I index documents whereby in the description I have the crap keyword, it gets filtered. Now I create that. Uh, okay, so if, in order for that to work, I need to restart Elasticsearch so that the plugin uh, gets loaded. So I go back here to my Elasticsearch instance. I restart it. Take a few seconds. Now, if I go back to Kibana and try to recreate it, I, I, it's, it managed to create uh, the, the ingest pipeline with the filter word processor. And I, now I can try to index a document that contains the crap word in the description. So I try to index a document with the description where it says crap, don't buy this. So if I index that document and I see what's been indexed, 
you can see that the crop work has been filtered out. And that's why you can, that's how you can build a custom uh, just plugin in a similar manner. Uh, you can build other types of plugins for Elasticsearch as you wish. As you can see, it's not uh, very complex. Uh, but as I, as I said earlier, you better base your reference of the plugin uh, on an existing plugin that uh, that is out there for for simpler uh, implementation. And with that, uh, I'm all the time for questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll hand over to the word to um, to the organizers. Thank you for attending my session. Now you have some time for asking any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, for your talk, for a very interesting session, including the live part. It was excellent. You know, really, I want to ask a couple of questions by myself, but I have to read them from the chat, of course. So the yep. first question from Evgeny. Who plays the role of coordinator in configuration with one master plus two data nodes? Uh, of coordinate. So the question, uh, if I understand it correctly, so in the Elasticsearch client, it tries first, so you, you just need to specify one of the nodes in the cluster, whether it's the master or the data nodes, it doesn't matter. So when you do that on the first time that you uh, try to connect, if, if the first node is not available for this reason, if that's the data node, the client tries to connect to the second node that you've specified in the configuration. If there is no second node, that, then the request will simply fail. If, however, the request succeeds, you'll also, if you specify it in the client only the first node, you'll get information about the rest of the nodes in the cluster. And any subsequent requests from the client will go in a load balancing manner. This is how the client works. So as you can imagine, it's uh, simply a REST client that works against the Elasticsearch REST API. And it tries to connect to any of the nodes that you've specified in the configuration, but at the same time, tries to make sure that it gets data for the rest of the nodes in the cluster so that they can be... Um, that's how it works. So it doesn't matter for, from the client perspective, it doesn't really matter whether the particular node is a uh, data or master node. Okay, thanks a lot. Yep. I hope uh, this is the, the answer that the other expected to see. If not, yep. you can always discuss it sometime later. So the next question is, what is the reason to restrict page for search with more than 10,000 records? If it is possible to find data using search after or cursor API, and why it's not possible to do it via page and size? If you want, I can't repeat the questions one by one. Uh, yeah, if you can uh, paraphrase. So, uh, if, so the question, if I understand it correctly, is why you are forced to use the cursor API for more than 10,000 documents and not use uh, page and size attributes? I think, I, yeah. I, I think if, if that's the question. Um, I cannot really give you a definitive answer to that. I uh, really haven't tried that myself. Uh, but uh, uh, in particular, yeah, as you, so the at first place, uh, we use page and size to make sure that we don't overload the data that we get from Elasticsearch. And pretty much you, you uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, you also have a configuration in Elasticsearch ML, whereby you can increase that limit that you have. But uh, I think you should, in later versions of Elasticsearch, you haven't tried it, you should be able to use page and size to work around that limitation of 10,000 records. Okay, thank you very much. So we have, it's a more specific question. Okay, uh, we have just about half a minute uh, to take another one. Regarding, regarding to the last changes in Elasticsearch license, is it secure to use basic license for system that will be sold as box product to customers? It should be, yes. Yeah. So uh, as, I've, as I've discussed with a few of my colleagues as well that raised that question. So the main reason that Elastic brought up that, li that license, and that's also mentioned in blocks and also in terms of the license itself, is to protect their uh, software as a service offering. So they have Elastic as a service, and on the other hand, Amazon as a very big and risky competitor also provide their Elastic as a service. 
And they created that license so that they, in a way, protect their service from other big vendors that would like to offer uh, uh, hosted Elasticsearch instances. Okay, and that's also one of the reasons that um, Amazon started this open distro project. Okay, thank so you. Michael. If you yeah. Okay. So it should be fine to use it in a box. That's uh, the answer. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Martin. We can uh, continue our discussion in discussion zone. And we'll see you again later. See you. Thank you, everyone. See you and talk to you in the discussion zone. Okay.